Thank you. Well, well, now we've resolved our technical difficulties. Uh, welcome back to the AIML session. Um, our first speakers this afternoon are Tiago Souza Garcia and Catherine Garside, talking about the creativity engine from messy notebooks to real-time inference. Hi, thank you, Joe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us after lunch. My name is Tiago. We have Catherine right here. She'll be speaking to you as well in a little bit. Uh, and we're going to be talking about this project that we've been doing for the past year called the Creativity Engine. All right, so let me set the scene before I actually tell you what the Creativity Engine is. I'm sure you've recognized sort of something like this. You're trying to write something, nothing comes out, right? You can only think of the blank page. That's about it. Um, now imagine you're 12 year old, 13 year old, 14 year old, a young person who wants to write their first short story, their first um, creative writing experiments, that blank page becomes so much more scary, right? You've read all these books, you go to your English classes, everything gets much, much scarier when you're that age. So that's sort of the solution that we've tried to find for this problem. It's called the Creativity Engine because its point is that it will start up your creativity. It's a way of um, getting past that blank page, even though the page we have here is yellow, but you get the point. Um, so what it is essentially is a, um, an AI powered chatbot that will, that's been trained to um, create stories, basically. And it's been trained on the archive of seven stories specifically. So a bit of background about the project. It was funded by Nuri, which is a Newcastle University Humanities Research Institute. And it's a collaboration between Newcastle University and Seven Stories, which is a wonderful museum in Usbon. If you're spending any time in Newcastle during the conference and you want to go there, it's a very nice part of town. It's a very nice museum. Um, and they're also the National Center for Children's Books, which means that they have a huge archive of drafts, notebooks, proofs, all sorts of material related to children's literature. And its point was to develop this interactive AI text generator to help children kickstart their creative writing. Uh, and it uses as its training material that archive from seven stories. I mean, part of it, not all of it. We've encountered a few challenges during this project, and two of the big ones, two of the really big ones that we had, are the ones that we put on the screen, and are the ones we're going to talk about today. So, from one, from one side, how do we go from these notebooks, proofs, drafts, to a data set that's suitable to train a machine learning model. And once we've had that sorted out, which took some time, as you all hear, how do we serve that in a, in a sustainable way and at a price that can, can be afforded, afforded by uh, galleries, libraries, archives, museums, institutions that are historically underfunded and always working on a, a shoestring budget? How can they afford to provide this service to their users? So to Catherine now. Okay. Uh, so with any sort of data science project, the data wrangling aspect seems to take up the vast proportion of time, and it was no different in this case. Um, so, so the Seven Stories archive, so their archive looks a lot like the, the image on the right. It's just uh, rows and rugs of bookshelves of uh, paper notebooks, letters to the author, as well as final uh, proof drafts. Um, so, so their idea of digitization is uh, digital images of these, uh, these pieces of paper. So Seven Stories give, give us um, materials from six individual authors uh, from their archive, and this is bo across both fiction and poetry. Uh, so we, we were given no digital text, we were just given these digital images, and we had around 10,000 um, images um, from the archives, and that was um, both handwritten and typed. Um, so many of these documents were sort of annotated and had strike through, and this is where the real challenge in the data processing um, came into. So I'm just going to show you some of the examples from the archive. So the first example is um, quite nice, nice examples. We have typed and handwritten. There's a few little formatting issues um, and a few little things that we need to remove from the text. But overall, it's pretty good material. Uh, unfortunately, this, this is not the majority of the text that we had to deal with. So this uh, second category uh, is sort of some more typed text, but we have a bit more annotations. And they're, they're starting to look a little bit more messy, uh, but there's some things that we can do to, to deal with this. Um, but then there's a third category of data, which is unfortunately quite a huge proportion of the data. 
So these are really messy notebooks. Some of them ha even have like coffee stains on them. Some of them have been like scrumbled up and refolded and there's lots of strike throughs. And some of the texts, if um, a human can't even read them, so I don't know what chance a computer has of reading them. So what did our uh, data processing and pipeline look like? So first of all, we used uh, optical character recognition um, to transform the image into text. So this is a sort of standard um, machine learning uh, algorithm that just, um, it learns how to take um, text out of images and turn it into to real text files. Um, so we, we started um, the project thinking that we could automate quite a lot of the process and uh, for so, some of the text that was, we were able to do that. But eventually we realized that we just weren't able to automate the whole data processing. So we decided to um, hire some students to do the, the job for us instead. Um, so we hired four students through the, the jobs on campus and their job was to manually correct um, the output from the OCR into usable text for our machine learning model. So a, a few months later, uh, we were able to gather the, the unique texts across the fiction and poetry categories, um, do some final validation and formatting, and um, split that into sort of training chunks for our model. So this is just a breakdown of the, the data that we ended up with. Um, so we've got fiction, uh, so around 2,000 samples from fiction and for, for poetry. And it's not evenly split between the authors, um, but just kind of gives you an idea of what we're dealing with. So modeling, so this was like the fun bit that we, we, we were both looking forward to getting our hands on. So the, the advent of transformer models kind of changed the language, uh, pr uh, language game for the future. And every big tech company now seems to have their own language model. And some of the models that are on the screen now, they weren't even in, they weren't even released when we started the project. And some of them have just been released in the last couple of months, or some of them are still training. Um, so these big models um, provide um, accessibility to the everyday user. Um, you can go in and use these large language models and fine tune them on your specific task without the hardware requirements of building a, a billion or trillion parameter model. So how did we build the creativity engine models? So we started with a baseline um, language model. So this is a large language model that's already been pre-trained on a huge um, corpus of materials. <clears throat> so there was an, uh, a few that we could choose from, but we decided to go for the Eleuther AI um, baseline model in the end. Uh, this is for a, a number of different reasons um, that we'll talk about later as well. Um, but the main one was that, was that it was it was truly open source. Eleuther AI is a, a group of volunteer researchers and software engineers, and their main goal is to make uh, language processing, lang like language models, um, truly open source. So like you can go and download the parameters of this model if you want to. If you compare that to um, projects like OpenAI's GPT-3, um, it's behind quite, quite a lot of um, layers of obstruction to the user. And uh, over the course of the, uh, the Creativity Engine project, we've seen access to GPT-3 in various different stages. And still, it's not quite as um, open as we would like it to be. Um, so once we had our baseline model, we needed some frameworks and we used the Hugging Face and Deep Speed um, frameworks to fine tune our model. And these are again, uh, more open source um, frameworks and communities. And then we add our seven stories uh, data and then we trained it on the N8 platform bead. And then we got some output from, we got, we got a model we could work with. So I'm just gonna show um, two quick examples. Um, so the first example is sort of with a generic prompt so once upon a time is the prompt, and then the model continues. There was a queen. The king and his court were very poor. The queen was very wise. She saw that things would not get much better for the court unless she married someone who could make his fortune on the land where they lived. So out of her kindness, the queen invited a handsome knight to visit her. But as soon as the knight saw the palace, he couldn't wait to leave. So the model produces quite a realistic text. You could um, convince yourself that a human wrote this, and it's also quite humorous. And it, it is in keeping with the, the children's theme that we want to, to continue. So the last example I was going to show, um, I'm not going to read it all, um, but so there was a new kid at school, her name was Mary. You mean this one doesn't speak English, said Mrs. Wrigley. So uh, Wrigley is a character that uh, appears in the, the source material. So uh, Wrigley, the Wrigley series is by Grace Nichols. And it's really interesting to see um, sort of characters and themes that occur in the source material uh, occurring in the output from the model. And this is really important because we want to steer the users back to the Seven Stories archive and get them engaging with the materials through, through the archive. 
So now we have a model, what do we do with it? How do we deploy it? Exactly, and that turned out to be a much harder question than we expected, because uh, if you ever played with machine learning before, you probably did it in the confines of your own office. Uh, you did your experiments, you get your results, and that's the stuff that you're interested in, the results. But we want to serve this in a way that can be affordable in real time, 24 seven, over the course of hopefully many years. So we have three main um, considerations in mind when we were looking for a provider for this type of, of service. Uh, we wanted to look at the price because it costs money. We wanted to look at the performance because the models are quite big and quite performance intensive. And ease of use, not so much from our perspective as RSCs want to deploy this somewhere, but rather how can an institution five years from now if they want to replace the model, how can they update their subscription? How can they change the terms of their subscriptions? How can they control the service um, without having to learn all about machine learning clusters, without having to learn about um, Kubernetes or anything like that, right? So these are our three main concerns. Just for illustration, I'm sure most of you have already guessed how it works, but that's sort of the pipeline that we had in mind that the, how, how the app is meant to work. User accesses from the browser. There's a web app hosted somewhere, sends a request to an inference API. The inference API looks at the model and gives a response. Pretty simple. Um, most of you probably already probably know uh, those two top services are sold most of the time together. Um, I mean, there are other options, of course, but that's also the easiest one for us to get at. Um, there's the model, host, model ho hosting and there's the inference, inference API itself. And we had two big problems with those two services. On one hand, the models are very large. We produced about six models, I think, that we have finished. Uh, they range between three and six gigabytes. Um, and because of the type of models that they are, of natural language processing, of text generation, they demand a lot of resources to actually produce an inference result. Right. The first two services we will look at were Azure Machine Learning and AWS SageMaker, which are sort of almost first port of call by default more than anything else. So let's focus on Azure Machine Learning. A um, couple of, plus, of positives and negatives. It was pretty simple to set up, even for a relative newcomer to uh, research software engineering as me. Uh, and it allows us to separate the model setup and the inference script, meaning that we can update the model independently of having to set up the whole API again. The problem was with this particular service, because of the size of our model, because of the performance requirements of our models, uh, we could not use the simplest option, which was to use an Azure compute, uh, compute instance, which is sort of the one that you get out of the box. We had to create a cluster, we had to define that cluster, and doing that becomes very expensive very quickly. So a couple of things that we tried out, a couple of SKUs, if you're curious about the specific specs of each of those, you can like, look at them online. The pricings are not current. I think they went down a little bit, but these were the prices at the point of testing. Uh, and you can see the inference time that we got, that we get is not, it's not terrible, but it's not reasonable either. So the standard um, SQ that we get, about 50 seconds, that would cost about 440 pounds a month if we were to run 24 seven. Uh, the best performing one within a reasonable price Standard F8, S, between 10 and 30 seconds for the inference, it costs about 440 pounds a month as well. <laughs> we tried a GPU-based one just for kicks, knowing full well we could not afford that, not even. And it was indeed under one second inference, which is great, and it would also cost 2,000 pounds a month. Now try ask your cultural institution to pay 2,000 pounds a month to have a service like this available. So our sort of, our sort of fallback option after you know, a few weeks of testing, of trying different SQs, of trying different configurations, etc., was, okay, maybe we can get to with between 10 and 30 seconds of inference, um, as long as we can shut down and start up the cluster at will, right? That's the obvious solution, so that's what we're trying to do. What we realize is that that process on Azure Machine Learning takes over five minutes. So if it hadn't been started for a while and some user went there, you had to wait five, six, seven, eight, most of the times around eight minutes for the service to become available, which becomes ridiculous. So we, it was still the fallback option. So we thought we'd look a bit further. So we looked at Amazon SageMaker, a couple of positives, serverless, exactly what we wanted, because we expect the service to be 
um, use sparingly but regularly. That means that you'll have a handful of users every day, potentially, but you are not expected to have big peaks, so you don't need it to be available all the time, necessarily. Uh, you had much quicker call slots, and it was much cheaper in the end. But there are some drawbacks to that, for the particular service that we're looking at. It was much harder to set up. It was um, it tied the inference code with the model, and we still had some problems trying to figure out how the hell the inference code was properly applied. <laughs> Uh, it was much harder to calculate the cost because it is a sporadic service. So on a good month, you might spend nearly nothing. If you had a search, you might end up paying thousands of pounds a month. And there was a sort of a lack of transparency in the available resources for the serverless uh, inference option. So they tell you how much RAM you have. They don't tell you what the processing unit is like, basically. In the during the time we were trying that option, we came across something that we should have come across a lot earlier, I suspect. Um, hugging face, so the library that we use to train the models and to ask for inference, has the Hugging Face hub, where people host their own models. We didn't look at that earlier because we cannot publicize our model because of the data that we used, basically. It's part of agreement, seven stories, we cannot make that public. Uh, we've learned that Hugging Face Hub allows you to keep private models, which is good. And we've learned very happily that they have an API, inference API by default, which we're now using very successfully. It is serverless. It has very quick cold starts. I mean, not very quick, not for critical applications, but for our uh, purposes is more than enough, less than two minutes, which is pretty good. It has a free tier that allows us to do lots of tests with schools before committing. Uh, and it is much cheaper, much easier to set up and maintain for an institution long term. So it's just literally an online dashboard. People just go change your subscription, change the model, or pose a different one, etc. There are some drawbacks. You have a lot less control over the API, and uh, the pricing is per character, meaning that you can send spend your whole allowance in one request, which is not great either. Okay, so this is the solution we uh, sort of settled on. There are next steps to take. Conclusions to make. OK, so uh, the next steps we have. Um, so we've already done a workshop uh, with teachers. Um, thankfully, we got some really positive feedback from them. And they pointed out some use cases that we uh, perhaps hadn't considered. Uh, for example, they wanted starting prompts for the users to use, um, just to give them a sort of uh, a, a way to start using the model and sort of an idea of what it can do. And they also asked for more customization. So we weren't aware that um, children are quite used to um, having uh, being able to put different templates or customizable characters on their um, interaction with web pages. So that was something that we integrated. Um, so next steps are to do a workshop with the users themselves. Um, so in October, we've got a, a workshop planned with some pupils, uh, with thanks to the English Association. And they're going to get on uh, hands-on with the app itself and in interact with it and test our different models and test the, the user experience that we've built. Um, so one of the sort of conclusions and next step is safeguarding. So safeguarding obviously is a huge issue when you're working with um, children. Um, so the idea behind this is uh, like bad language isn't an issue, but bad ideas are. Uh, so it's, re it's fairly easy to deal with the bad language. We're just using like simple profanity filters on the output of the model, but it's much harder to deal with um, potential offensive or toxic material. So we've um, to just, we've tried to tackle this at a number of different levels. Uh, the first one was selecting our base model, so making sure that the material that that's trained on doesn't conclude toxic um, material. Uh, so then we have our fine tuning material, which is specific to children's stories. There's no toxic material in that. And then finally, if it <clears throat> if it um, if it produces output that's toxic anyway, we've got some filters and we can use initial prompts and a reporting feature in the web app to tackle this. So coming back to the challenges that we faced on this project, um, so the first challenge was how going from these notebooks um, to um, suitable data for our machine learning model. <clears throat> and for GLAM institutes, uh, so galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, um, they could be priced out by this kind of um, labor-intensive um, work, and which is a real shame because um, y they have a lot of data, but um, turning that into data that can be used with machine learning algorithms can be quite um, labor-intensive. And so they're missing out on the, the really cool applications that you can do with that data. And the other challenge that we spoke about at the beginning was serving this model in a um, sustainable way. So the long-term future of this model is kind of um, up in the air because Seven Stories are a charity and it's up to them to sustain it beyond the, the life cycle of this project. Um, 
So Tiago discussed some of the options, um, but some of these options will price out um, these institutes. And again, that's another um, barrier for entry for humanities-based um, researchers. Okay, thanks very much. So we, we have five minutes for questions. Um, I think there are questions on Slido that, that which should be on the program, and that's the preferred routes. So what OCR model did we use, Catherine? Uh, we just used the Azure um, ML model. <laughs> Very simple answer. I saw there was a question in the room over there. Yeah, um, is there like a stochastic element to the model? So say, once upon a time, prompt return the same Result every time, or is it going to be uh, yeah, so it's a probabilistic model. Um, so you can do all sorts of ways of sampling and um, the results that you get back. Um, but yeah, you can put once upon a time in a million times and get different results each time. Although uh, the specific um, DAPI from Hugging Face has an option for use cache, so you can cache answers and get the same response every time as well, <laughs> uh, which we're playing with. So there's another question there. Um, so I guess, so the question, do you try to minimize bias in the trained data, not just toxicity, but linguistic structures, narratives? Um, so I think we want we want the style of these uh, specific authors to come through. I know that the, it's not balanced between the authors in the data set. So the fiction is dominated by uh, the Valerie Bloom author, but we really want her stylistic elements to come through. So we not necessarily want like we kind of want it to be biased towards um, the stylistic elements of that. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, and so the ultimate goal of the app itself was to get more people to look at the archival materials in the first place. Uh, so we wanted to keep those characteristics. We wanted to be in actually at the very start, there was uh, an idea of creating, uh, of basing the model just on um, um, black Asian minorities authors uh, to try to get that voice out very clearly. So essentially, we don't try to like thin things out, uh, smooth things out. There's a question in the room, then I'll go read that one. Um, so you can imagine a spectrum of uh, models from the most simple, which we used to do, which is you predict the next word given the last word in some book I've told to it's a real person who's made a story in their head just now everything down. Where is this? Like, what is it? What are your experience of reading the output? What, what is it inside the model that you're producing the output? What level of conceptual interestingness is going on? Um, so to repeat the question, basically, the, from the big, <laughs> sorry about that, was from the big um, sort of um, scale of a random next word to it feels like there's a, a wizard writing this somewhere else, <laughs> what we feel this model is. Is that fair? Um, so my background is in English literature, so <laughs> not surprising, I guess. Um, I, I am surprised by the results. Like they're not perfect, not by any chance. And depending, and they're very much constrained by what kind of prompt and how much context you give it. Uh, so the once upon a time ones sometimes are great and it feels like this is a full story here that I could easily be fooled was written by someone. Sometimes they're quite nonsensical. To some extent, we're not too worried about that because part of, you know, it's, it's the idea of the engine. This is a startup. It's a, a way for someone to write their own story, right? So nonsense is actually quite good if you're a creative writer because it sort of frees your mind and gets you to read stories. But we've been, like, I don't know for you, Catherine, I've been presently surprised with the results we have. And the more we continue the story, the more within boundaries of normalcy and actually full ability, if that's a word, which is not, uh, the story is. Just as a sort of a quick side note, when we first thought of this project, I've tried it out just a simple, it was at the time the GPT-2 model, we tried it out on children, uh, not children, young writers, uh, and I didn't tell them it was a model, I just told them, can you help me out with this story I'm starting to write, and no one picked that. <laughs> and that was an untrained, unfine-tuned model uh, using the previous generation of uh, Transformers wood generation. Do we have time for one more now? 
Because there was just someone here. Uh, so someone was asking, do you consider on-promise deployment? We did consider it. Uh, that's not, in the institution didn't really want that. That was sort of the fallback option. They had at first wanted to make it part of their on-site exhibition, uh, but then COVID hit and many other things. And part of their point is that they want to um, extend the reach of Seven Stories, which is very well known in the region, but less so nationally, to its sort of rightful place of being at the National Center for Children's Literature. So they want to reach beyond the Northeast, they want to reach the whole country, so they prefer it to have it online. But we did consider it when we couldn't find a, <laughs> a cheap enough option. And we're done. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>